Well, good evening. Welcome back to church here on Sunday evening, and I appreciate you uh, coming back. I hope that uh, the Sunday school lesson this morning and the morning service have been a great blessing to you. And again, I encourage you to share those. Uh, if you go on Facebook and that's how you are seeing these, I encourage you to share those videos uh, so that your friends and family also have the opportunity to be able to study the Word of God with us. Let's take our Bibles and we'll go over to the book of Acts. On Sunday nights, we've been studying through the book of Acts and we're very quickly making our way through. We are in Acts chapter 20, as we have been for the last couple weeks, and uh, working our way slowly through this particular chapter, but a lot is going on in this chapter. In Acts chapter number 20, uh, Paul has gone and visited through Macedonia and Greece. He did not go to Ephesus, uh, but... After raising Eutychus from the dead, who fell out a second-story window and died during the preaching, uh, Paul comes to Miletus, and he calls the pastors from Ephesus to come and meet with him. And that's what the last two Sunday nights have been about, what Paul's message um, to these pastors from Ephesus. And tonight we continue in that same thing, what Paul is saying to those pastors so just to back up, I want to read Paul's sermon to the pastors, in a sense, up to this point. So let's go back to um, verse number 17, and we'll read up to where we will begin tonight in verse number 25. Acts chapter 20, verse number 17 says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, verse 25, Behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to, rec to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my depart departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Let's pause here. We'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll dig in. Dear Lord, I thank you once more for the great opportunity, the great privilege, and the great responsibility to be here in your word, studying it. And I ask, Lord, that you would speak mightily from it and speak through me, Lord, in spite of my uh, incompetence, in spite of my mumbling. Lord, I pray that you would speak mightily through your word to the, to the ears of the hearer uh, this evening. And we ask all this in your son's name, I pray. Amen. Do you ever wonder what it is that God blesses in the ministry? Here, Acts 20, the Apostle Paul's in Miletus. He's speaking to the pastors from Ephesus. And he goes back and he reviews his own ministry there in Ephesus. And we can say that for the three years that Paul spent there, that it was a great success and that God did bless what Paul was doing there in the ministry. What was it then that God was blessing in the ministry? There are three things that I want to look at. 
concerning this. The first is purity of conscience. Paul's purity of conscience. Look now in verse number 25. It says, And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day, that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. The purity of Paul's conscience. Over in chapter number 24, verse number 16, which we have not gotten to yet, Paul says this, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. To, he says, a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Do you want to be the kind of person who refuses to listen to their conscience? Whose conscience becomes dulled? Whose conscience becomes seared? I heard somebody said, well, that person doesn't listen to their conscience because they don't like to listen to advice from strangers, indicating that their conscience was a stranger to them. And I feel like some people do behave in that manner. Uh, they know what's the best choice. They know what's the better thing for them to do. And yet they just over and over and over again refuse to listen to it and reap the consequences of it let alone would they listen to the conscience of their parents or the conscience of their pastor. They won't do those things either. Here, Paul tells us that he is, his conscience is pure. Paul was uncertain about things. We see here in verse chapter number 25. It says, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. He's uncertain about where he's going to be. He doesn't know if he's going to be back to see them. Here he seems to indicate that he's probably not going to be able to see them again. Um, in other words, Paul does not have plans or designs for his own ministry, for his own career. He is waiting on the leading of the Holy Spirit, and that's quite intense. That I don't know where I'm going to be next week. Now, we know that Paul is making his way back to Jerusalem, but beyond that, Paul does not know what he's going to be doing. That's pretty intense as well. I mean, as pastors, we like to plan throughout the whole year. We like to be prepared for what's coming on. But then to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, he was quite uncertain about it. James 4, 13 through 15 talks about this. Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live, and do this or that. You heard people say that before, right? Hey, if it's the Lord's will, or Lord willing, we'll do this. Uh, in West Virginia, and I don't know if most people said this, I know I said this, Lord willing and the crick don't rise. Uh, you know, if it's the Lord's will and the crick doesn't rise so that I can't cross it, <laughs> you know, we'll be in church, uh, we'll be doing this, we'll be doing that, Lord willing. Paul was quite uncertain about his future and what he was going to be doing, where the Lord was going to send him. But despite that uncertainty, he was unwavering in his own personal testimony. Let me ask you this. If you were to leave your job tomorrow, what would your testimony be at that job? You might be thinking, well, I've been meaning to work on this. I've been meaning to uh, be a better worker. I've been meaning to start showing up on time. But if you were to be done right now and leave your job, what would your testimony be there? as a Christian, and your work ethic in general. If you were to die today and be buried up here on the hill behind the church, when your family members and friends get up behind this pulpit to, to give your eulogy, to speak of you, what would your testimony, your reputation be today? You might be thinking to yourself, well, I've been meaning to be faithful to church. Well, I've been meaning to get involved and to join the church and really put my heart into it. Well, I've been meaning to get things together with my family. Well, I've been meaning to start tithing again. Well, I've been meaning to patch up my relationship with my spouse. Well, I've been meaning to patch up my relationship with my kids. I've been meaning to get that thing right and to surrender it to the Lord. But if you were to die now, if you were to die today, what reputation would you leave behind now? Paul's testimony was unwavering in the sense that if Paul were to die today, 
he looks back and he has nothing whereby he needs to be ashamed of. Maybe he isn't completely proud of what he did before he got saved, but he even indicates about that, that he was being sincere and doing what he thought was right, even though he was sincerely wrong. He was unwavering in his testimony. Paul here is saying, in, in a sense, if, if any man, whether he be Jew or Gentile, perish in his sins, his blood shall be upon him. Because I am blameless. I have shared the message. And so if someone, being within earshot of myself or, or somebody else who has shared the gospel with them, die in their sins and go to hell, their blood is not going to be on my hands because I can look back and say that I have done everything in my power, that I have obeyed God's command in every way. I don't have to be concerned with that. How many of us as Christians can look back and say, I have done everything in my power. That there will be no one's blood who is on my hands because I chose not to share the gospel with somebody. And they died. Instead, Paul indicates that he has given the whole counsel of God. He says, Wherefore I take, uh, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. What is this whole counsel of God? Well, it's referring to all that God has revealed to us concerning our salvation. The whole doctrine of Christ being crucified, of Christ being born of a virgin and living a perfect life, of Christ uh, being crucified, resurrected, repentance towards God, faith in Jesus as the Messiah, uh, and as the, the uh, a priest to atone for us. This is the message that Paul has delivered. This is the message, the whole counsel of God. He didn't hold any of it back. And so Paul can look back and understand that his conscience is clear. His conscience is pure. Then he stops talking about himself and he looks back at the pastors once more and begins to speak directly to them, to tell them about their priority. And so he says, verse 28, now this is an imperative, you take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which hath which he hath purchased with his own blood. And he speaks, you take heed therefore to yourselves, first of all, take heed to yourself. Over in 1 Timothy 4, 16, take heed unto thyself and unto thy doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and they that hear thee. The pastor, the minister of the gospel, the Christian who shares the gospel must be on guard because we do have an adversary an adversary that deals in particulars, an adversary that is very dangerous. He plans very well ahead, and he knows his enemies very well. We have an adversary, and he launches attacks, very particular and pointed attacks, at Christians who desire to serve the Lord with all their heart, who desire to be testimonies and witnesses, and he launches attacks to weaken them and to destroy them. Not just attacks at pastors, but yes, I would say they are probably on his most wanted list. He says not only to take heed at themselves, he says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. This word overseer comes from the Greek word episkopos, and it means this is that a man is charged with the duty of seeing that things are to be done by others and done rightly. Uh, somebody who is a curator, a guardian, or a superintendent. And the Bible also not only refers to pastors as um, overseers, but as shepherds as well. And this idea of shepherd is being used in this passage as well. 1 Peter 5.2, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, 
not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. There, he, he indicates here in these passages as well that there's going to be opposition. He says in verse number 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So there's going to be opposition attacks from without. These wolves that are going to come in. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.12, when it speaks of Hymenaeus and Alexander. Uh, he says, Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may l learn not to blaspheme? Um, they were removed from the church. They were kicked out because of the things they were doing. They were enemies. They were wolves that had come from without. And so Paul has warned, and he warns many times throughout his books, to beware of false teachers, to beware of Christ, uh, Judaizing Christians, to beware of uh, even uh, worldly religious people who are going to try to come in and change the church. They're going to come in and try to water down salvation and try to blend us in with the rest of the world's religions. Watch out. Be careful for the attacks that come from without. But he says also in the very next verse, verse 30, to watch out for the attacks from within. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Timothy, from within your church, other pastors here in Ephesus, as he's speaking to them, there will be people within your church that will rise up, they will get some weird idea about doctrine in their head, and then they will try to gain a following from within your churches, and they will try to pull them away. It may not be prevalent within our church or, or, or the church for which you may be a part of, but I can tell you there are so-called independent Baptists out there that have more of a cult following than they have an ecclesia following. Some of these people have more followers on the internet than they do in their own churches. That's not necessarily biblical. Now I know that the New Testament church did not have the internet and did not have the means and the opportunity to use that as a witnessing tool and as a teaching tool. However, as a pastor, my focus is to be on my flock. And there will be, there can be, opposition from within. In Revelation 2, verse number 4 here, speaking to the church, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Here he's speaking to Christians within the church. I have something against you because you left your first love and followed after something else. And he says, shortly after I go, forces will arise outside the church. Forces will arise within the church. And they're going to draw people away from the church. Draw people away from their devotion and their dedication to God. And they're going to replace it with selfishness. So he says, not only to take heed to yourselves in verse 28, and also in verse 28, to take heed to the flock, he says here, to feed the flock. It says and again in verse number 30, and, all, and of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch. And remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day. Feed the flock. This is part of what shepherding really is, to feed the flock. We've all, we've all heard in the past about the founding of great universities like Yale. And when I say great, I don't necessarily mean their spiritual value these days. Uh, but back in the 1700s when Yale was founded, um, there was a president towards the end of the late 1700s by the name of Timothy Dwight. He was the grandson of Jonathan Edwards. And he was the president of Yale from 1795 to 1817. And he spoke in 1814 to the graduating class. And he said, and I want you to imagine for a second, today's president of Yale standing up and saying this. Christ is the only, the true, the living way of access to God. Give up yourselves, therefore, to Him <clears throat> with a cordial confidence, and the great work of life is done. Give up yourselves, therefore, to Him 
with a cordial confidence and the great work of life is done. He is saying the hardest thing and the most important work that we can do as Christians and as, as humans is to give up ourselves to the Lord. To give over ourselves to the Lord. Boy, for the president of any university to make a statement like that today would be career suicide. They would be gone faster than you could finish reading their statement. But can you imagine that this was the standards that our schools, our universities in America once held? That this is what they used to preach? Lastly, I want to look at the price of our redemption. If we go back again to verse number 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, redeemed by the blood of God. We have songs, hymns that we sing, redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Romans 5, 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, <clears throat> we shall be saved from wrath through him. We cannot separate the blood of Jesus Christ from redemption, by the way, from salvation, from the gospel. It, is, it cannot be separated. We must not heed to the voices that call on us to downplay this side of the gospel. It is a vital doctrine which must be shared from our pulpits. As I said there in Romans 5.9, being justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Ephesians 1.7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ. This is the only way. There is only one propitiation through the blood that is shed on the cross by Jesus Christ, the sacrifice for our sins, if we willingly accept that and believe in our hearts that. I think it's interesting to note that here when this virus came around, the Catholic Church suddenly decided that, oh, hey, you know what? I guess you don't have to go uh, to the priest to confess your sins. You know what? You can go and talk to God yourself. Imagine that. That's what the Bible said all along. This isn't the first time. Back during the SARS breakout, the Catholic Church did the same thing. And the priests here were going to issue a general forgiveness to all their parishioners back then. There is only one mediator between God and man. The Bible says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to feed the flock of God which is among you. Oops, I went the wrong direction. Sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who hath through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? It says, if the blood of goats and the blood of bulls could purify us, then how much more shall the blood of Christ purify us? It is inseparable. We are redeemed by the blood of Christ, and we are redeemed from the world. We belong to Christ. We shouldn't merely live a good, godly life for the sake of our pastor, for the sake of our church, or even for the sake of our own testimony. There is a higher law by which we must live a clean and purified life. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says this, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. And what is this price? The blood of Jesus. His death. Therefore, because of this, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so my body then is to be used to glorify God, not myself. My body is to be used to glorify God. Glorify God in your body, but also in your spirit. My spirit ought to be glorifying to God. 
The manner in which I speak to my friends, my family, my neighbors, my general spirit ought to also be glorifying to God. Let's not forget that part too. We are redeemed from the world. I think if we have a good understanding of redemption, that will go a long way to help us as Christians to live. It will give us the right motivation to do what is right. Knowing that we belong to God should help us to live to the, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He paid a very high, a very steep price for our redemption. And of course, it is the very least that we can do to live for Him in return. But more than just surviving for Him in return, what about thriving for Him in return? Thriving. That, means that goes beyond just keeping your head above water. That means we're gaining ground. That means we're doing well. Not well financially necessarily, but spiritually. Here are the pastors from the churches at Ephesus. They have heard the whole counsel of God. And Paul is reminding them to continue to promote the whole counsel of God. It was vital for them to hear this message because as a reminder to them that the church is of God, the church is not of man. It doesn't belong to me and, and it doesn't even belong to you. The church is the Lord's. It is His bride. So, in conclusion, let's never forget the joy of being redeemed. And that's why I like that song, you know, Redeemed, now I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And it's, it's a joyous song to sing it that way, and I like that. Or, you know, love lifted me. I know some criticize love lifted me, that uh, the words don't match the melody, but uh, when we, we stand here in this lofty place where we are, in this place of great joy and a place of victory, and we look back at where we came from, when I can say, I was sinking deep in sin, but I'm not anymore. I was lost, I was lowly, but I'm not anymore. Love lifted me, and to sing it in a joyful manner, I think that is exactly how it's meant. May we never get over the joy of being redeemed by the blood of Christ and the joy that is also found in serving. There is joy in serving Jesus. I like that song too. There is joy. We may think that if we get involved in church and serve the Lord, we lose all the fun things in life, and that is simply not true. There is joy in serving Jesus. And I hope that you are able to find that joy. I hope that you are able to Clear the record between you and the Lord. Get saved if that's necessary, if you haven't accepted the Lord as your Savior yet, but get involved in church. Join church. And I hope that after this is over, that, that maybe I've been able to reach some of the people in our area that, that don't go to church. And I hope that you can come in and, and join in with Shenandoah Baptist Church and become a part of who we are, become a member of the church, and join in serving the Lord right alongside of us. And that is my hope, that is my genuine desire for you. Again, if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, comments, prayer requests, um, questions, just uh, let me know. Message me on Facebook. My phone number's on the website. You can email me. And there are many ways in which you can get in contact with me, and I look forward to hearing from you. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I do thank you for the great opportunity once more today to be gathered together in your presence, in your house. And Lord, as you have stated, where two or three are gathered together, you're there in the midst of us. And Lord, we may not be gathered together in one place right now, but we are knit together in our hearts. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would be amongst us and that your spirit would work in our hearts now. I ask that you would take this passage of Scripture and that you would speak mightily through it, that you would apply it, that you would open up our eyes to our own lives and help us to be inward looking and inward changing. And Lord, I pray that you would give us and recall to our minds the joy of being redeemed, that you'd help us to look back at our ministry in the past and that you'd help us to have nothing to be ashamed of knowing that we've done our best. And if we can look back and be ashamed, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to look forward and plan to be better. <clears throat> and Lord, I ask that you'd put your hand of blessing upon this week, that you'd work amongst our members and keep us safe and healthy. And we ask all of this in your son's name I pray. Amen.